Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan O'Sullivan, and uh, it is a great pleasure today to have Professor Francisco Minaldi join us today. We always take pride in being timely in our seminars, and today I think we are exceptionally timely uh, in the wake <laughs> of the Venezuelan election, which just happened yesterday, as you all know. Uh, Professor Minaldi is going to speak to us about the future of Venezuela, politics and oil, and certainly there's a lot to be said on both counts. Um, as many of you are aware, he is the RFK professor, a visiting fellow, or rather visiting professor at the Kennedy School. Um, and his full-time position is that he's a full professor at IESA in Caracas, Venezuela. And there he was the founder of the Center for the Environment and Energy. Um, he is one of the leading uh, scholars and uh, thought or public opinion uh, shapers of politics and economics of Latin American countries. Um, and he has been quite involved in what's been unfolding in Venezuela over the last few years and more. He has a um, PhD from Stanford University and uh, has been with us for the last years actually teaching a course that I think some of you may be in on uh, politics and oil. So um, what I'd like to do is ask him to make a presentation. We're going to have this be off the record except for the, his opening comments, which we may decide uh, to put forward to the world, but the rest of the conversation will certainly be off the record. So um, with that, Francisco, let me welcome you and ask you to take the floor. Thank you, Megan. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and as you say, it's a timely uh, moment to be discussing uh, about Venezuela. So uh, how, how much time do you want for the initial remarks? Um, or you know, I would take 30 minutes if you okay, want. Okay, sure. Okay, I'll so let you know if you're going on. Excellent. Uh, so, um, the, I mean, for those of you who might not uh, be following what's happening, uh, yesterday there were uh, elections after the, the death of President Chavez in uh, about 34 days after his uh, death, uh, elections were held, and the uh, candidate that President Chavez uh, supported, uh, I mean, before uh, dying, he anointed him as his uh, uh, successor. Um, won with 50.6% uh, of the vote and the uh, opposition candidate. This is with 99% of the uh, precincts uh, in. I mean, we ha still have a 1%, and that 1% includes, interesting, uh, importantly, the foreign vote, which is about, uh, it's going to be probably about 60,000 uh, um, uh, votes. That is not enough to change the result, but it will. Uh, shorten the margin because in, in, uh, outside of Venezuela, Capri uh, the opposition does uh, pretty well. So it is a 1.5 percent difference between the 50.6 that Maduro uh, got and, and and the 49.1 percent that Capriles got. Uh, Candidate Capriles of the opposition uh, didn't recognize the, the victory of Maduro yet. He uh, asked for a recount of, of the ballot. I mean, the internal, I mean, the, the opposition didn't have uh, at uh, the time of the announcement the total, uh, the sort of all the uh, acts, the, the act, as I, how you say, the sort of the. Was it a the, scheduled election or what was it? T time just after. The it, I mean, the, according to the constitution, if the president uh, dies, uh, the, you have to you convoke elections in 30 days. They this, interpret this had not been scheduled before. This no, not the regular. No, no, no. The, the uh, president Chavez won the elections in October 7th, and then he died. Uh, uh, I mean, a few days after, uh, a month after, he should have been sworn in uh, as president. Uh, so. Um, so we, uh, I mean, the candidate, of the, the, I mean, the winner uh, said that he uh, um, accepted the idea of an audit of the of the of the ballot. It's not clear uh, what is going to happen uh, today. Um, I'm not sure uh, how uh, thorough the process will be or how will be done. The electoral council it's uh, uh, composed of four members that are very strongly tied with the government and one uh, that that it's. Uh, uh, related to the opposition, and, and they have used the majority systematically to sort of uh, avoid any sort of uh, uh, accountability. For example, to give you an idea, in Venezuela there are no international observers. Uh, I mean, only they invite some select selected people uh, to accompany them, as they call them, uh, to uh, companions. They, they, they call them, which is a 
sort of a weird term, and and they and they bring them only sort of the day of the election, uh, so they cannot sort of see the whole uh, uh, process. So, uh, but to give you a, a little bit of of, of uh, background. Um, Chavez won with uh, an 11, 11 point margin, uh, so there is this is a reduction of about 10 points in the, in the margin, and um, that was in October 7th. In the after that, uh, President Chavez' uh, popularity declined, and uh, uh, Maduro's uh, approval rating uh, also declined uh, throughout December and January and, and February. And by the time, the, uh, by the week before Chavez died, Maduro's approval rating was 40% and Chavez was 55% from uh, a 63% approval rating uh, at the time of the election. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about, about this later, but th that was mostly due to the fact that the economic situation has worsened very significantly since the October 7th election. Uh, but after the death of Chavez, Amazingly, I mean, I, I, I thought that uh, there would be some sort of sympathy effect, but it was really amazing to me to see that Chavez approval rating after he dies, approval rating of his, of his work as president increased from 54% to 75%. So suddenly the guy was doing a great job. Uh, and, uh, and Maduro's approval rating went up from about 40% to about 53%, right? So... Uh, and the uh, surveys done two weeks before the election showed Maduro leading by 20 points. So, uh, so we all thought that it was a uh, the election would be. I mean, uh, if you talk to most Venezuelan observers, 10 days ago or 12 days ago, they would have told you that probably Maduro would have was going to win by more than Chavez had had won, which. I mean, if you think about it, it was uh, amazing because, uh, I mean, uh, Chavez, of course, was a very popular president, and so we were all really surprised by how this sympathy effect had completely sort of changed the underlying variables. And particularly, what's striking because Maduro, as I said, had an ap approval rating of 53%, and usually approval rating is a very good proxy in Venezuela for, the, uh, for how much they, an incumbent gets in terms of votes. So... But let me tell you a little bit about how Chavez won the, the, the election, and that will uh, show you a little bit uh, where we are now and where we might be headed. First, uh, I mean, it's int interesting to note that during President Chavez, Chavez came into power right here. Uh, in fact, the week that Chavez won the election was the lowest price of, of oil in history, in real terms. So it, it's sort of like a, an omen of, of, uh, of how, I mean, what, the bad luck of Venezuela, of having uh, the guy come here and then, you know, the price of oil. He had a, 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 an, a, a, a scheduled uh, recall referendum around here, but he was able to postpone it until about here. And he, with this increase in the price of oil, he started uh, spending a lot of money in social programs, and he was able to, to change the, the, the situation and win that recall referendum. Then won uh, uh, by a landslide elections in 2006 uh, with, with a 26% margin. Uh, then in 2010, there were legislative elections, and this decline in the, in the price of oil uh, and the mismanagement of the macroeconomy had created a recession in Venezuela that led to a situation in which the government got 49% of the vote, the opposition 48 and a 3% by a unaligned but opposition sort of party. So, so the, the, the government uh, almost lost the legislative elections through a mix of gerrymandering and the way the electoral systems work. They still got about 60% of the seats, but they got only 49% of the vote. But after that, he got lucky again, and the price of oil uh, went up, and he was able to do what you will see here. Um, this is the uh, uh, the um, uh, fiscal expenditures, this, the total spending in, in the country, central government uh, real expenditures, uh, the growth. And as you can see, during the previous elections, he, they, they, ha they engineered a, a huge expenditure boom to win those elections. But then afterwards, of course, they had to adjust because uh, this was a, a, a very significant deficit. And then they had the decline in the price of oil here. And so they had to, um, uh, to actually cut spending. <coughs> And that led to a recession that we will see in the next slide. But then, uh, in 2011, they again engineered a huge expenditure boom. Uh, 
and uh, and this allowed uh, Chavez to win the elections in 2012. So this is an electoral uh, budget cycle, as I said, on asteroids. If you compare this to any other country, I mean, this is really unbelievable. I mean, this, this is all talking about real terms, about, you know, increasing uh, expenditures by 50% in a year. It's uh, in, in real terms, that's above inflation. I mean, this is really uh, 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 something that you will not see anywhere. Uh, the, the public sector total deficit, uh, in fact, in 2012, was close to 17%. Uh, I mean, there are different estimates between 15 and, and 17 percent, because the, the official data is now not, not, not completely transparent, so we, we have to estimate uh, uh, a bit of it. Uh, so the total uh, expenditures in the country reached a uh, uh, highest in history. I mean, the deficit was the, the highest in history, and the total spending the highest in history, about 50 to 51 percent of GDP. To give you an idea, I mean, the total taxation in the U.S. is 20 percent, 22 percent of GDP. So this is, uh, I mean, this is, uh, of course, this is what... Uh, I mean, the, the Scandinavian countries spend, but in Latin America, uh, this is like twice the regional average of expenditures. Moreover, the amazing thing is to have a deficit like this when you have the highest price of oil in history. So it's it's really uh, uh, something that, that it's really uncommon. And you can see here that the deficit, they, they had a little bit of so surplus at the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the increase in the price of oil, but then, uh, I mean, the deficit have kept growing despite these, uh, these uh, uh, very high oil prices, and you could uh, uh, think that a, a deficit like this in 2009 might, might have some merit because there was a decline in the price of oil, but then, you know, oil keep going, kept going up and the, and the deficits uh, kept increasing, kept piling up. And so that, uh, I mean, the, the, what we saw in terms of expenditures also translated, as is usual in Venezuela, to the real economy, and so there was growth uh, uh, before uh, uh, 2008, then there was a, a very significant decline in growth, uh, an actual sort of growth collapse, and and then uh, the expenditures that we saw before created uh, an increase in in in, uh, in GDP, uh, in the rate of growth of GDP uh, that uh, started to uh, starting to decline this year, uh, because again an adjustment after the election, they were able to decrease. I mean, Venezuela has the highest inflation in Latin America and one of the highest in the world today, but still uh, they were able to decrease very significantly the inflation rate from about 30 something percent uh, here to about 20 percent uh, or a little bit less uh, here uh, just in time for the election. You might wonder how they did that. Well, they did it by importing a record high of uh, almost 60 billion dollars. Uh, so Venezuela, by the end of 2012, had for the first time since the price of oil started going up a current account deficit. So that means that we basically are importing more than all the oil boom exports, uh, plus we are importing more than, than all the additional revenue in, in terms of exports. Of course, all this was completely unsustainable, and that's the reason why you see this, uh, this uh, adjustment here that started happening the day after the election, I mean, pretty promptly. Of course, then they realized that President Chavez's uh, health was getting fast, uh, grow, uh, uh, worse faster than, than some of they had expected. And so uh, they, at the beginning of the year, of this year, they started to sort of uh, limit a little bit the, 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 the magnitude of the, of the uh, expenditure cutting, but it, it already had some uh, effect in the economy. Moreover, the lack of availability of foreign exchange started creating scarcity. Venezuela has the highest scarcity level since 2007, uh, which is uh, a level of scarcity that, compared to international data, it's typical of a country that it's in, in, in a war or something like that. So uh, you, have, you, you don't find about 30 to 40 percent of the goods that you want to find in a supermarket when you go there. So it's really, really, really striking what, what happened. And, and, and so that uh, uh, created a decline in the popularity of the, of the, of the government. Uh, so um, it is important in that sense to notice that President Chavez won by 11 points, which sounds like a lot. But let me tell you about other presidents in the region. Uh, basically, all of them had a, a windfall uh, of different uh, commodities that South American countries are all net exporters of commodities and all, all benefited from the windfall, uh, but none as much as Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela had a 10-year windfall of 330% of GDP. Uh, I mean, that's one of the largest windfalls that any country in the uh, it's the largest windfall that any country in the region has received in history, in, in, in this region. Um, of 
of course, the Middle East is a different story. Uh, but uh, um, but other presidents in the region, uh, incumbents, uh, receive a, a much uh, a higher increase in popularity. If you think about uh, almost all the other incumbents, Lula in Brazil, Uribe in Colombia, um, um, the Kirchners, uh, um, I mean, except for Peru, all this country, Correa in Ecuador, Evo Morales in Bolivia, except for, for as I said, for, for the case of Peru, all the other countries had higher levels of popularity and uh, all of them got re-elected by a very significant margin. In fact, the average margin uh, of an incumbent in South America has been 28 percentage points in the last, uh, uh, in the last decade. So, um, so Chavez did pretty poorly compared to, other, to these other uh, uh, cases. And I think it has to do with the fact that Chavez was, on the one hand, much more radical than, than then. So he, he had the political capital to be radical, but the, the, most of the population didn't like that radicalism. If you look at, at a, a Venezuelan uh, survey, it, it, it's really surprising to see how far the president was from the median voter in most policy positions. I mean, Venezuelans do not like expropriations, about 70%. Uh, Venezuelans do not like a bad relationship with the U.S. Venezuelans do not like a bad relationship with the private sector. They believe that the private sector is a very important part of the of the economy and should be, uh, and the government should work in cooperation with it. Um, and you go on, on and on. And most policy positions uh, that Chavez had, uh, one famously, I mean, 90% of Venezuelans believe that Cuba is not a role model for the country. President Chavez uh, spent thousands of hours talking about Cuba as great model for Venezuela. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is striking, but what did they like about this guy? Well, they loved the social expenditure, of course. Uh, most, I mean, and Venezuelans between, 19, uh, between 2004 and 2008 had their largest increase in real income uh, since the 1970s. So, um, since the previous oil boom, so uh, so most of the of the of the population really liked that. Uh, uh, poverty rates declined very significantly during that period, and then again recently in 2002 a little bit. But but the rest of the period, if you take the average growth during the whole Chavez administration, Venezuela had the low, the, the worst GDP performance in the in the 14 years of Chavez. Uh, so he had a terrible performance at the beginning, a great uh, performance because of the oil boom between 2008 and 2000, 2004 and 2008, then a, de a decline, as, as I showed there, uh, and then very recently a, a spike in 2012. But on average, Venezuela, the only country doing worse than Venezuela on average in this period in GDP growth is uh, Haiti with a, you know, a earthquake and... and, and Variety. I mean, I don't have to tell you about how bad AT has been doing. So, so it's not a, a stellar performance. However, in terms of real income of of, of the population uh, during the, this particular period, there was a consumption boom. Of, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, the only present was 30, 40 years ago. So. Um, so this is very important to understand uh, what chavismo uh, is is about. Uh, and uh, and but on the other hand. The, the figures that I show you, uh, and this one, which is sort of the, the last one in, in terms of the sort of the, 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 the Chavismo's performance, is the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the external debt has been growing dramatically. So not only the country uh, um, had the highest level of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, income in history because of the real price of oil being uh, at its highest point, but it, it went into dramatically into, into debt, and Venezuela has increased its external debt by $70 billion. And, and, and external, the external position of Venezuela, I mean, if you count that some of Venezuela still has some uh, assets, uh, some liquid assets in, in, in dollars, but the external position, including the foreign exchange reserves, uh, the, the, the net external position is now uh, pretty negative. So this is in contrast to most other oil countries that, at least until 2008, behaved pretty reasonably this time compared to the oil boom of the 70s and 80s. After the, the, the financial crisis of 2008, and after the Arab Spring, some of the OPEC countries have also become a little bit reckless. Uh, uh, but, but compared to Venezuela, I mean, still, they are pretty uh, orthodox. Uh, I mean, this is uh, an extreme. So, um, so uh, I mean, it's important to understand that Chavez was also made, uh, I mean, Chavez also came into power because of oil. Venezuela had the best per performance in GDP per capita in Latin America until uh, the 1970s. 
uh, and, and by this point, Venezuela had the lowest uh, poverty rate in the region, the highest standard of living for three decades. Uh, I mean, to give you an idea, between 1950, in this period, between 1950 and 1970, uh, almost a, a million Europeans went to live to Venezuela, I mean, immigrated. So that gives you an idea about the standard of living that they were going to. Um, and, and so, but after the, the oil booms, uh, Venezuela had a, a growth collapse of unprecedented uh, uh, levels. In, in fact, in this period between 78 and, and the point in which Chavez got into power in, in, in 98, Venezuela had the worst economic performance of the region except for Nicaragua, who also had you know, a very, an earthquake and, and civil war. And, and so this is a, a terrible performance. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I don't have time to get into this, but we, we are just, uh, uh, I mean, a, a book in which a number of Venezuelan scholars studies this period is, is coming out, uh, edited by Ricardo Hausmann, and, and uh, sort of the, one of the key uh, founds of the book is that most OPEC countries did, did terribly ba bad in this period. Venezuela did worse than, than uh, most, but most of them did pretty bad in terms of growth performance. The difference is that some of the o uh, OPEC countries had this huge level of income per capita, like the Gulf countries, and therefore uh, the impact on, on, their, on, on their populations were not as significant. But in terms of consumption per capita, uh, the, the collapse of, uh, of, uh, uh, of oil income per capita in Venezuela was so large that it basically, even though, of course, mac macroeconomic mismanagement ha is partly responsible, I mean, this was, to a some extent, a, uh, an unavoidable sort of crisis because the country was extremely dependent here on oil and it, it, it got into a significant debt uh, uh, in the 1970s. By the way, so we are the only country that it seems to be copying all the mistakes from the 70s and, you know, and, and doing them back but with asteroids this time. So uh, he, uh, I mean, the first five years of Chavez, uh, actually we did even worse and Venezuela until 2003 had even, I mean, I, I think we surpassed Nicaragua by, the, by this time in terms of bad performance in, in the, this 25 year period. However, the oil boom generated a, a very significant expansion of GDP per capita that was also, as I, as I said, combined uh, with a consumption boom of unprecedented levels uh, in its magnitude and uh, with a reduction, a significant reduction in, 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 in poverty. Then we had this, uh, this decline uh, uh, after the financial crisis and we have not recovered significantly. But the main point for, to take from here is that we had a good performance here, terrible performance here, and then an oil boom uh, allowed us to have again uh, a good performance. And the other take is that we are around the level that we were in GDP per capita that we had in the 1970s. So the last 40 years Venezuela uh, has not improved its uh, standard of living. Uh, which is a terrible, of course, result. If you look at a, a, a variety of indices of institutional quality, Venezuela, since these indices were calculated, was uh, not a good performer, but it has collapsed during the Chavez period. And, and to give you an idea, this, is, this shows that only 2.8% of the countries in the world uh, are below Venezuela in, in an index of rule of law. Uh, uh, to give you the, so uh, that's about five countries of the 200 countries that are in the world uh, perform worse than Venezuela. And as you can see, the, the index of rule of law, uh, there was a dramatic uh, decline uh, in this period. Um, and we have become much more dependent on oil. By, by today, we are exporting, I mean, 96% of our exports are oil. Uh, the other 3%, the other 4%, three are, are, are uh, other natural resources. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the fiscal reliance, we are in around 60% of our uh, fiscal, uh, our government expenditure comes from, from oil. So what uh, about the future of the country? Well, Venezuela uh, is uh, uh, an important oil producer, not as much as it was uh, before. I mean, the percentage of the total world production of Venezuela has declined significantly. Uh, however, uh, we still produce about 2.8 million barrels of oil per day, and we have huge uh, oil reserves. Uh, this uh, graph shows that Venezuela has the, la the largest uh, index of reserves uh, over production, uh, and this sort of, you have to take this with a grain of salt for two reasons. First, uh, because, of course, if you have a, 
a large index of reserves over production, that also means that you have high reserves, but also that you have low production. I mean, and Venezuela has very low production to, compared to the level of reserves uh, we have. In addition to that, most of these reserves are e e extra heavy oil, so it's not uh, the same quality as the other uh, the other countries uh, reserves and requires a much more investment to make it commercially uh, uh, viable uh, moreover uh, I mean the, the, the way the government estimated the reserves sort of overestimates them but still I mean the, the important fact is that uh, we have plenty of, of, of oil for the future if we can get uh, the investments done but the oil industry is in, in, in terrible shape I mean, production has been declining uh, uh, for the last uh, uh, f uh, 15 years, and and, and this uh, the the blue line, which is the number of, of oil rigs uh, uh, in operation, basically tells us that uh, I mean that we I mean we should be around 100. When when we were increasing production in the 90s, we had more than 100 oil rigs in operation. Today we have about 60, and uh, and that uh, it has to do with the lack of of, of investment. Uh, that, that's the sort of the general figure here. So uh, let me uh, show you uh, what's happening with the, with the, with the oil, national oil company. I mean, PDVSA's debt has uh, increased dramatically from about $3 uh, uh, billion dollars to uh, today, about $41 billion in the last uh, 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 figure. Uh, and on top of that, you have to add uh, this uh, 10 to 11 billion that in a const I mean Venezuela uh, uh, PDVSA is not paying their uh, contractors uh, on time. Schlumberger recently said that they were stopping uh, work in Venezuela unless they were paid and they were paid a little bit. Uh, but but this is amazing. Some of these uh, 11 billion dollars uh, have been accumulating for four years. So there are companies that have been not been paid for four years. Um, I mean, we have the, the broader arbitration settlements over, over the expropriation, and amazingly, the, 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 because of the overvaluation of the exchange rate, uh, I mean, PDVSA was changing the, the dollars to bolivars at a, a rate that, made, that gave them very little domestic currency because of the dramatic over, over expaluation of the official exchange rate. And as a result, the central bank had to give PDVSA, had to basically print money and give PDVSA the equivalent to all the operational expenses of the company last year. So that gives you an idea of the, the degree to which this is a, a crazy uh, a way to run an economy. I mean, the, the, the total uh, uh, expenditures, uh, I mean, uh, um, investments in exploration and production are about 11 billion. Uh, so this has not been increasing, but the debt has been spiraling up. And so that basically shows you that the Venezuelan government is getting the national oil company into debt in order to pay uh, for current expenditures in social programs and, 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 and money, uh, and giving money to the government. Uh, so, um, the, 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 I mean, if you look at other variables in terms of uh, Venezuela, is, is, uh, the domestic uh, uh, subsidies represent about $20 billion, the, the domestic subsidies to, to gasoline and other uh, products, uh, uh, about $20 billion, billion. I mean, basically, we give the gasoline for free, uh, away for free. Uh, you, you fill your tank in Venezuela for less than a dollar. At this point, if for, a, for a quarter. 25 cents. Uh, I mean, and you uh, fill the, your Hummer with, uh, you know, with uh, 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 with gasoline. So it, it's really, really crazy. Then we are subsidizing some countries in the Caribbean because it was part of uh, the foreign policy of President Chavez, in particular Cuba, with a, a, about 100,000 uh, barrels of oil per day. Uh, that is mostly a subsidy, and and then an additional uh, sort of uh, 60 to 80,000 barrels to other uh, um, other countries in the region. In addition to that, we ha have a line of credit from China that has to be repaid by sending about 400,000 barrels of oil uh, per day, and then PDVSA does not get back the, 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 the basically the cash flow from that uh, from, from from that because it's used to repay this debt. That is, it, it is not PDVSA's debt; it is the government's debt. So basically, the oil company is sort of. Uh, I mean, the future production of Venezuela has been already uh, committed uh, for this for this loan. So uh, in terms of the sort of the. I mean, it's not like um, some people predict that the Venezuelan oil production will collapse, uh, but it's unlikely that they will be able to to fulfill the promise of, uh, I mean, we have a lot of potential in terms of, I mean, and we have already uh, um, contracts signed with uh, a variety of companies, including uh, Chevron, uh, um, 
uh, ENI, uh, uh, Repsol, uh, CNPC, and, and, and a Russian group of companies, particularly Rosneft, and um, that uh, that are supposed to to increase production in the uh, extra heavy oil uh, uh, areas, uh, but this is not materializing and had been delayed for more than four years. Uh, so uh, so the the oil sector uh, sort of. Uh, prognosis is, is, is not great. Uh, it has uh, a lot of potential. They are becoming much more pragmatic, I think. They are trying to, to obtain uh, foreign investment, but it, it has been re really hard to materialize. Plus, on the conventional oil side, Venezuela uh, has a, a, a difficult uh, future because the traditional areas of, of uh, production ha are, are in decline and, and very old, I mean, 100 years production in the Lake of Maracaibo. And the areas that were sort of compensated for that decline in the eastern part of Venezuela, uh, which has two of the biggest fields in the country, one of which produces 500,000 barrels of oil per day, are, are starting to decline. And I have seen uh, uh, internal documents from the company uh, that show that they believe that it's going to decline 300,000 uh, barrels of, uh, of, of production. That not, not only that field, but all the fields in that area that produce about 900,000. So we will have a, 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 an important decline that uh, might be compensated by the extra heavy oil, but of course the extra heavy oil is less uh, uh, profitable in terms of fiscal uh, returns, and it requires uh, uh, a variety of, of other uh, infrastructure investments and, and the like. So, uh, so that gives you uh, an idea of the importance that the price of oil has to for Venezuela. But if because if oil uh, production uh, is not going to increase uh, significantly, uh, even even there is a slight risk of, 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 of additional decline, although my, my baseline scenario is a slight increase in the next uh, six years. I mean, uh, but the Venezuelan government is, it, 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 it was spending money, at least until until now, uh, uh, as if the price of oil was about 120. So, uh, so we, we uh, um, I mean, they are uh, cutting spending and already is shown in terms of the popularity of the, of the of the government, uh, but um, uh, but still, I mean, if the price of oil does not go up uh, but go down, they will face a, a very st tough situation. Particularly because already, as I showed, the I mean, the accumulation of debt and the uh, external position of of the, of, the, of the country, including external debt versus. Uh, the reserves, uh, it's it's in pretty bad uh, shape. So what to expect next? So the result of yesterday was, uh, to an extent, uh, uh, I think a very significant defeat for, for the government. I mean, Maduro uh, was given uh, this popularity uh, by Chavez. You know, Chavez still has 70% popularity according to the polls. He, he declined a little bit in the last two weeks, but still at 70% strong. Uh, but his uh, his son, as uh, he his, his himself calls uh, uh, Maduro, says he, he's Chavez's son. I mean, got only 50%. So so that it's a terrible performance uh, for Maduro, particularly since they 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 expected. Uh, that they were going to win by 20, uh, by 20 point margin just two weeks ago. So already the major sort of uh, leader of the other faction of the Chavismo uh, yesterday tweeted, because in Venezuela everything is now by uh, tw uh, Twitter, uh, tweeted that we have to look inside ourselves and, and criticize and, uh, and have a lot of out, uh, self criticism about the, the mistakes we have done because uh, this uh, result is ter it's really bad. So, uh, so already you see a faction uh, in the government uh, starting to sort of uh, criticize in a way uh, Maduro's performance. And, and of course, uh, the presidential candidate of opposition did so well under the abusive circumstances. I mean, to, to give you an idea, we had only 10 days of campaigning. We had uh, a, an average, I mean, the opposition candidate only had uh, the opportunity to have three minutes per day of ads in, 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 the, in the media, in different uh, media outlets. But the government had the three minutes plus, plus seven minutes from the, from the uh, um, uh, government uh, uh, ads that are not paid in all media every day, plus uh, what they, we call cadenas, which is basically that when, whenever the president, in this case Maduro, which, uh, which was uh, the interim president, uh, wanted to give a message to the country, all TV and radio stations had to, uh, you know, uh, uh, link to, to, to his uh, uh, message. 
and and basically he used this uh, dramatically so that he's basically had sort of a media exposure of about uh, 20 times what Capriles had uh, in, in, in during this month. So so it's uh, it's uh, so outrageous. The, the, the head of the campaign of the government of the mobilization uh, of the campaign was the president of Petróleos de Venezuela of the oil company. So not even the appearance of you know of having some sort of separation between the party and the and the state. Uh, so so all this has uh, I think um, put them in a in a tough situation with the, with this result in the sense that for Venezuelans a result of less than two percent and maybe even even smaller when all votes are counted uh, does not uh, uh, does not give legitimacy under the terrible circumstances uh, of, of abuse of, of power and all the irregularities that have happened uh, I mean if you ask me I think that the counting of the votes is more or less fair I mean the uh, uh, I mean, except for some uh, uh, polling stations in which the opposition witness either this did not appear or was bribed or 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 or, 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 or left or whatever. Uh, I mean, most of the polling stations we have the information. Uh, I mean, um, uh, that the government has, and 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 so it's uh, so so after the the recounting and everything is done, we will have a, some sort of. A, a, Credible measure of of uh, of how uh, real these results were, but still, uh, if you look at the irregularities that have, we have had in the past, the estimation that most people had is that between one and two percent margin, we enter into into the realm of not knowing who who won the election, even if if after counting everything and you and taking into account these effects. Uh, uh, Maduro uh, has more votes. Still, the, I mean, as I said, the the, the perception of, of uh, the use of the state power to abuse and and then getting, uh, uh, I mean, winning by such a thin margin, I think it de de delegitimizes completely uh, Maduro. Moreover, he's facing this terrible uh, economic crisis that I showed you before. By the way, one one crucial point is that they they had to they they devalue on February eighth, uh, which was something that I was really surprised by because uh, I thought that they would wait until Chavez's death. There are two interpretations for this fact. One is that they were believed that they were so strong that they could devalue and, and so leave Chavez with the legacy. I mean, the devaluation was made by Chavez, not by Maduro, and so Maduro could start uh, a, a fresh term without that, uh, uh, that burden. The other interpretation, which I think is more plausible, is that uh, they didn't know when Chavez was going to die, and and, and 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 the guy was amazingly strong in terms of, I mean, being dying for like months, and they didn't know what what to do, and and so eventually, they decided they had to 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 take some action in terms of the economy because they were, uh, I mean, in 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 very deep trouble, and so they 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 took the decision to devalue uh, one month before Chavez died, and of course they knew that the time was against them, and so they. That's why they convoked the election so fast, uh, but things uh, did not work out as as well as it was uh, expected. So, who is? Uh, I mean, the, the the question is, the margin I think is really relevant because it it constrains President Maduro to what he he can do. I mean, uh, about. A, 700,000 people that voted for Chavez now, now this time voted for Capriles. So this is an amazing uh, thing that it just in a, in a few months uh, these uh, people decided to leave the, the you know the the, the the government party. And uh, uh, on the other hand, one wonders. I mean, uh, if I mean if, if Maduro. Um, will be able to move to the, I mean, because one typical expectation is this guy has to construct back a majority and so he will have to move to the center uh, compared to Chavez who had all these radical positions. Uh, he didn't make any move to the center yesterday in his discourse, was really, 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 really radical. Uh, but uh, what one might expect that he, he might do that. But on the other hand, he faces a lot of uh, internal opposition uh, and divisiveness in the Chavismo, so it might be hard for him to do that while his popularity uh, is declining. So he faces a, a really tough set of choices now, and, 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 and he uh, hasn't been shown to be a, a, I mean, a, such an I mean, a effective leader, at least yet. So I don't know how he will manage uh, that. The other question is, what is, 
the, what are the preferences of this guy? We don't. We know very little about him. It's amazing how difficult to find information about about the, the life of uh, Nicolas Maduro is. We know that he was a union leader uh, uh, in the in, in the uh, in the Caracas bus company as the, uh, uh, tied to the to the Met, sort of the Metro bus. And he uh, and he was very radical. He, he lived in Cu in Cuba for a while, uh, sort of doing some training. And then uh, came back and, and, and became involved in Chavez uh, um, uh, movement after Chavez uh, had the, the coup attempt in '92. Uh, but other than that, it's very hard to, to, to know. Some people believe he ha he he's a, a pragmatist in the sense that he, will, for example, reestablish relations with Colombia uh, after a tough uh, period with uh, the new president Juan Manuel Santos, who was the sworn enemy of Chavez. Uh, so uh, some people that know him personally say he he is a, a guy that it's easy to talk with and is relatively pragmatic. But but it's hard to know. The things that we know is that first he's not Chavez and he has shown uh, not to have the nor the capacity nor sort of the the the, uh, the charisma that, that that he had. The second thing is that he's not a military guy, and that's very important because uh, Chavez uh, knew how to. Uh, uh, managed the military very well because he was not only a, a, mili a military guy himself but he was a professor at the military academy for years and a lot of the uh, current military officers were his students and so he, he knew a lot about them. Most militaries, the military guys in Venezuela, uh, even the Chavistas, uh, are not uh, radical left-wing uh, uh, guys, are nationalistic and, and might be considered sort of left wing in the sense of they like a large state and, and, and probably are a bit authoritarian but they are not uh, you know they, they don't like Cuba uh, so to give you an idea the, 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 the opposing leader inside the Chavismo Diosdado Cabello the president of the National Assembly who is a former military guy and he's the head of the party of the of the socialist party of Chavez party went to Cuba only once before Chavez before the recent sickness of Chavez in 14 years and uh, that's like you know, being a, a Muslim and not going to to Mecca. I mean, it's it's uh, it's unbelievable that you that you are not going to 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 La Habana uh, to see Fidel Castro and you know all the other leaders in the Chavismo went there every time they could and established the best relationship they could with uh, with the Cubans. Not it's, it's not the case of Cabello. It's not the case of most of the mili of the top military guys. And and we have among the twenty. Uh, I mean, we have twenty three governors in Venezuela. Of those twenty are from the Chavismo. Of those eleven are former top military officers. A few of them are guys that have some political support base different from the personality of Chavez. Most of the others are were simply elected because Chavez said you have to elect this guy. But a few have some and, and they I think they believe that they could become president, all of them. And they, they and they all of them would like to be president and, and they all of them are pretty pragmatic and and if you think about them they, they are more like uh, Putin and the people surrounding Putin than than about than than Chavez in the sense of you know they are authoritarian. They are uh, uh, they are nationalistic, but they are not uh, uh, radical left wing. So this is a very difficult coalition to, to to manage in the future. And Maduro is not a military guy, so that will be uh, really uh, tough for him. Uh, for the opposition, I mean, there is uh, the the good uh, thing is that the opposition will be united behind Capriles now. Capriles becomes the uh, undisputed leader of the opposition, uh, which he was not a, a month ago, uh, because of the, all of the criticism about the, him losing the, the the election last time. This time, uh, I think everyone uh, is amazed by how he what he accomplished in in, in in the time he had. But the opposition now has a comp is, has not sort of institutional space. The only we have only two governors. Uh, I mean, a very minor governor, but two governors. One is Capriles. The other one is a former Chavista guy who is with Capriles. Uh, these are the only two governors that the opposition has in relevant states. Uh, the, the other one, as I say, is a very small state. And then uh, the opposition does not, uh, it's recent, it's losing the, the, I mean, the Chavismo got a few uh, defectors from the opposition to get the 60% uh, of the National Assembly so that they can pass uh, some uh, additional types of laws of 
of different levels. They uh, they completely control the the electoral council. The, the Supreme Court by now they they kicked out the last opposition person from the Supreme Court. So they have, they, we have exactly zero people that are not completely committed to the, to the regime. Of course, some are committed to some faction of the regime and some to the others, and eventually that might matter. And then, the, the, as I said, uh, uh, I mean, and the other thing is that the electoral council, the only member of the opposition, uh, his term ends uh, next month. So so they might. Uh, include someone uh, from the Chavismo, and we will have zero uh, uh, members there. The 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 term that it st started officially on February of this year, or January actually, uh, ends in six years. So this is a very long term. In the in the middle, there is the potential for a recall referendum, uh, but it requires uh, signatures of a, 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 a sort of like three million people, and the last time people signed in a petition to recall the president, they were discriminated for years afterwards uh, uh, from job positions uh, in the government and, and social programs, etc. So I, I'm not, I don't know how, how much people will be willing to do that. We have local elections this year that have been postponed. I mean, some of the Venezuelan uh, uh, municipal council, council members have been there for twice the time that they should have been, four additional years simply because the elections were never held because they didn't fit into Chavez's plans. So that gives you an idea of the independence of the Electoral Council. We, we should have those elections this year. Uh, maybe they postponed them because the timing doesn't seem right now that Maduro didn't, didn't do that as well. Uh, but the question is, are we going to have free elections? I mean, not fair because they are not fair anymore, but at least that votes are relatively well counted. Uh, 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 I don't know. The next major election is the legislative election of 2015. I mean, there is a still, I mean, two years to go, and it, it, anything could happen there. And uh, I mean, of course, as I said, the oil price could completely uh, change the, the, the this issue if it goes up significantly. I mean, Maduro can buy again uh, some uh, uh, significant support. I don't think he can do as much as before because the economy is in very bad shape in general. Uh, but he can do something. And the other big issue is how far the international community will allow sort of Venezuela to move in a more authoritarian uh, way. I mean, the only TV station that was opposing the regime was just sold to a Chavista uh, entrepreneur. Uh, and because the otherwise they were uh, uh, going to be closed, basically. I mean, because the, their concession expired and they were going to be closed, as, as the government did with the most uh, rated TV station in the country. So, so a lot of... Uh, movement in the direction of more authoritarianism, but uh, a stronger opposition and united opposition mean that, and, and a declining popularity of the president mean that we will have a tough and in, unstable time in the, in the future, and, uh, and I mean, things do not look great, but uh, there is some potential for, for change happening. So. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, that was really rich and, and filled with great uh, facts and analysis.